get started. I think I'm going to keep the kids kind of informal. So normally I like to do the presentation and get on a roll, and this is being streamed, and then take questions at the end. But, you know, sometimes if you don't understand something, and this isn't like a big intellectual deal where you've got to build and build and understand everything to go into the next concept or any of that. Nonetheless, if you feel like I need to elaborate or didn't understand something or want clarification, just raise your hand. I will repeat the question. Why? Because it's streamed. I can hear it, but the audience can't. So, having said all that, fasten your seatbelts. Money passed. Well, uh, the people that, and I do add color and editorialize almost everything I say, but if it's a fact, I'll let you know. And most things I try to do is based on fact. It is a fact that money's been almost everything in our, what I'll call in the quotation marks, opponents like to point out the fact that, well, money can be anything. It can be salt. It can be sugar. It can be seashells. And all those things are true. But in the real analysis, in the real history of money, it's always come down to precious metals. That's what the people at large have determined over centuries to be valued as, as money. The first real coinage took place approximately 700 BC in Lydia. Um, that's what they look like, a little picture there. I have a, one of my clients, I don't know if he's still with me or not, retired early. He was a software developer and sold his company for a tidy fee. He was somewhat bored, I'll say bored. He didn't use that word when he talked to me, but he decided and he started a, a Lydian Mint and did a takeoff coin, a very beautiful. And he started, I don't think he, continued on. There's not much margin in silver and gold coins. I mean, it's a very big volume business. The only way to make a good living selling precious metals is to have a lot of turnover. It's just not that big a markup on these things. On the bullion side, not talking about the rare coin side. So you can progress through. Most of us are familiar with the Roman Empire from a monetary standpoint. And start off with the denarius. It was basically almost pure silver ended with a copper coin that was silver plated that was so thinly plated with silver that it basically rubbed off after a few exchanges on the street. And that's called debasement of the currency, as we all know. They actually took the coinage in, what they could get a hold of at the point of a gun, and remelted it, added dross to it or base metal, put a stamp, re-stamped it, said it was worth so much because I say it's worth so much. Kind of familiar with that, aren't we? <laughs> And it goes on, and then, of course, going all the way. So you can see this is silver-oriented. Of course, gold is definitely part of the story as well. So from the 700 BC, Lydia, to the 1960s, silver has been used as money. And as a fact, it's been used more often, more places, more transactions, by far than gold for all monetary history. There's no doubt ifs, ands, or ups, downs, or in-betweens about that. That's actually the way it is. Like it or not, that fact stands. Does that make silver money today? Not necessarily. But you can't rewrite history. And I'm not going to allow anyone to rewrite history. So get, a, get another copy of this and put it in your, your basement. Dormant money. Dormant money, OK. So through generations, silver's been used to protect wealth, purchase power, and establish commerce. And um, hundreds of years, silver and the gold ratio has been at 10 to 15 ounces of silver to one ounce of gold. It's about 88 to one. So if I stand at this wall and every foot, my foot is 12 inches, really is, or just about, and every one foot is 100 years, and I go like that, and I walk across this room, the silver gold ratio would be 10 to one, excuse me, all the way through to about here. So that's a lot of hundreds of years, like a thousand. And then it would go to about 15 and a half to 16 to one about here. And then in the last couple of feet, it would shoot up and it hit 100 to one a couple of times. It'd vary between 16 to one in 1980, January 21st, when Hunt Brothers cornered the silver market and oscillated. Now, 
when it was 10 to 1, for those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, that's what I call the natural ratio, which right now, the natural ratio is about 9 to 1. Now, why would silver track a ratio to gold of, it's really 12 to 1, 10, 10 to 12, but it was basically at the natural. Why would it track gold at that ratio for all those centuries? It's a bimetallic standard, and it just came out of the ground that way, and that's really the answer. When it performed the same function, and they were both considered money and money only, they tracked the natural ratio. It did bifurcate in, uh, you know, I forget the year, but much later on, I gave it an analysis, or gave it a marker there. And that's when, uh, London was having, or England rather, was having a huge problem in their monetary system. And Sir Isaac Newton said, we'll put you back on the gold standard. And that really took care of their massive problem. And the reason he was given the title of Sir, he was knighted, isn't because of Newtonian physics, it was because he put the Bank of England back on the gold standard, saved their asses. That's why he was knighted. And of course, being so brilliant, he asked him, well, what's the proper gold to silver ratio? And he didn't know. So I looked out the window and saw at that time that the ratio at the time, that day, was about 15 and a half to one. So he magically said, well, it's 15 and a half to one. The worst thing you can do in a bimetallic standard is to fix the ratio. The market has all power. The market should be free to determine all ratios, all interest rates, all prices, all transactions. I'm called free market, you know, I love free markets. We really don't have many. So you don't really want to fix it. You want the market to determine whether it's 16 to 1 or 15 to 1 or 10 to 1 or whatever. So anyway, after the crime of 1873, where they tried to demonetize silver in the United States, that was what the cross of gold speech was all about. Silver's been at the 15, 16 to 1 ratio, what I call the monetary ratio or the classic ratio by edict, man edict or mandated, it would be that ratio. And then, of course, when it was demonetized and we went on a gold-only standard, then it was allowed to trade wherever it went. And of course, silver is now, as you asked me, about 88 to 1. Very, very high. I don't have time to go into it, but basically it's, uh, it's basically the amount of paper that's traded on the futures exchange. You're looking at a price of what, the co what a contract costs. You're not looking at the price of silver, really. And that's a fair statement for silver and gold and cotton and oil and flaxseed and wheat and anything else you want to name. It's a tail wagging a dog. I mean, I have nothing against the futures market, especially in theory and how it was used to hedge and how it protected the farmer and allowed the speculator to make a buck or lose a buck. I'm all for that. It's free market. But the way it's been distorted with derivatives on top of derivatives, you can put options on futures and you can put options on and options on futures. And it's gotten so distorted. And so um, <clears throat> mismanaged relative to the amount of physical commodity versus the amount of paper that they don't track. So it's not really a market that is uh, given a true price uh, determination. And that's true in the commodities markets. It's true basically. No, it's 10 to 9 to 1. So, yeah, it's gone down from 12 to 1 in the 13th century to 9 to 1 in the 21st century. So I'm going to go ahead and move on here. Uh, early paper money. Who know? How many people know that the Chinese invented paper money? Yeah, it's not too well known a fact. Marco Polo came back after his big venture and seen all the silk and you know all the stuff in Asia. But the thing that impressed him the most was that people would accept a piece of paper as final payment. It was on a paper standard. They were backed by metal, and then like. All metal backing it slowly deteriorates. How many think there's a problem with the gold standard? 
Someone's going to take me. She's not sure. You know, the, the problem isn't gold or a gold standard. The problem is humans. You know, I get, I've gotten the argument. In fact, one of the first lectures that I ever gave was, you know, someone got very, in fact, it was a professor emeritus from Ohio, from Ohio, from Idaho, where, near where I live. And he got right in my face, which is really unprofessional. Another speaker, if you've got something to take him on with, you don't do it in the forum, but he did. And so I'm dancing around. I say, you know, it's not gold, because gold's an inert element on a periodic chart that people covet and said, you know, most people agree it's real money, right? That has nothing to do with me or gold. It's just what is. That's the problem, and that's what I pointed out to this professor was that it's not gold's fault that the bank said they had this much gold and they were lying about it. That's a human problem, not a gold problem. Well, everyone gave me a big round of applause, and oh, was he angry at me. <laughs> anyway, I digress. So there's a piece of paper on the left. That's a $20 receipt for gold on, on deposit. And of course, that's not money, but it is a certificate that can be redeemed for money. And then on the right side, one of my favorite charts, showing what a $1913 is worth 100 cents, and today we're probably less than a nickel, and that's a fact. So we have given the Federal Reserve, a private corporation, the mandate to keep our money system stable. And I don't know about you, but if I had a 100-point quiz and my daughter came back and got five out of 100, I think she failed. And I think the monetary system has failed. But <laughs> failed everyone. I mean, well, we can get into politics later. And, you know, there's a lot of arguments. Yeah, you're making good points. I don't have time to go into it. From a purely factual perspective, five out of 100 isn't a good track record if you're supposed to have a stable monetary system. I don't think you can argue with that statement. Whether it's still working or not, yes, it is still working. The inflation effect, you guys already know this. It's just kind of a fun chart. You know, you look at what a price of bread looks like in 1970 to so today. They're up about a, over 1,000%. Looking at a house, you're up over 1,000%. Looking at, uh, you know, cleaning products. Looking at the minimum wage, so you know people get used to the idea. In fact, a lot of people are taught to believe that in, a little inflation is good. You know, it's like a little poison's okay. If you take a lot, you'll die, but a little bit, that's okay. It's not true, but people are taught to believe that it's true. Financial adjustments. I just threw this in here to show you that um, relative to the Great Depression and how uh, much the markets were shocked and went down relative from their highs. Even though we've had World War II, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the 1970 oil blockade, or oil shock, we'll call it, where we had trouble getting oil at the pumps for a while, I had to get in line depending on our license plate. The big crash in 1987, which I was pretty involved in the stock market at that time, actually. The tech wreck of the early 2000s, and the 2008 financial crisis, all of those basically touch that red line that I've got there. And they're all significant. In fact, the 1987 crisis was very, they're all significant. But, uh, you know, the 2008 crisis is significant. But what I'm trying to point out here is that as significant as those are, we've rebounded off of all of them so far. And they are really an order of magnitude, well, they're not 10 times less, but they are significantly lower than the Great Depression in relative terms. But if Doug Casey's right, then the next depression is going to be greater than the Great Depression, and the next one called the Greatest Depression or the Greater Depression, who knows? I'm not saying we will, I'm not saying we won't. What I am saying is that uh, we haven't really fixed anything since 2008 in real terms. And we've got about twice the debt load we had back then. We don't have a bailout ability anymore. We don't have a bail-in ability. And no tree grows to the moon. So we're in interesting times. And knowing those facts, you don't have to go overly fearful. Basically, 
All I do with what I teach and what I do is a hedge position. You really only need 10%, maybe 20 at the most in what I teach, county of physical and, and the stocks I pick. Because if this thing just muddles on another 10 years, and I doubt it, but I've been saying that a while, you know, you're gonna be fine, you know? There's always ingenuity, inventiveness, the human spirit, and I'm still an optimist. I really think if things get <clears throat> to where I believe they're going to get, that'll bring out a lot of the best in people. It'll bring out a lot of the worst initially, but that will be kind of a temporary effect, I think, longer term, if we have to grind through harder times or more. And, re and the reset to me is not only a monetary reset where things are repriced, so the price of the houses and the cars and the financial instruments and the stock market and the gold market and everything else gets repriced, I think it'll be a repricing of our consciousness. And what I mean by that is that we will find out what value is again. It's not really that valuable when you go out to dinner with your family and everybody's staring at their cell phone, you know? It's a pretty low value proposition. You know, you're gonna get back, put the cell phone down and you have a heart to heart conversation. You get into some like intellectual ideas and you throw them back and forth and you're, not afraid to be challenged because you're using free speech and you're using your mind and you're using your heart and you're opening up and you're trying to evaluate things that make this life so interesting, so magical, so mystical. The kind of things that I grew up with where I was challenged to think for myself, I wasn't given the answers. That's value. And when times get tough, <clears throat> those instinctual properties that we all carry as human beings I believe strongly will come out. Present money, I'm gonna have a couple charts on this. Everyone in this room is probably fairly familiar with me and my work, and it's not just me, there's several of us. <clears throat> but many of us have referred to the Economist Magazine so many years ago, and putting this phoenix on the cover with burning currency at its feet and a medallion around its neck, that's gold colored, and getting ready for a world currency. So they put it right under their face, and those that don't know the Rock of Rockefeller, the uh, Rothschilds own a fair amount of the Economist. So that was sort of a heads up what to expect. I think that was in 1988, if I recall correctly. This chart I had permission to use. This comes from the movie Thrive. How many people know what I'm talking about when I talk about the movie Thrive? few of you. Look it up on the internet. I think you can watch it for free. Uh, Foster Gamble and his wife put it together primarily. A few of my friends are in there. Catherine Austin Fitz is in there and a few others. And I don't have a pointer. I usually bring one. And I don't really need to have a pointer. But what I want to point out is something that I think probably at least half of you in this room are well aware of but I would say 95% of the population at large is not aware of. And what I'm going to say is gonna sound perhaps conspiratorial, perhaps illogical, perhaps off the wall, but it's an absolute, complete and total fact. And the fact is, if you look at this hierarchy and you find out who's the lowest of the low of the low on this pyramid, it is called government. So if you think Donald Trump or Barack Obama or anybody else has got a lot of power, you better think again. How many remember the movie Network? Remember? I forget the star's name, but he said, there is no Afghanistan, he's Afghan. There is no Russia, there is no China, there is no United States, there's Exxon. Bechtel, Pfizer, GE, and Monsanto. Remember that? Well, what was he saying? It's a global corporate society. That's what he was saying. Well, they should pay. <laughs> no, no, you should pay. You're in, they're in charge. You look up to government. You're actually down here somewhere. And I'm joking with you, and I'm telling the truth as well. So then what do you have above the corporations? How, the corporation, how does a corporation that loses money 10 years in a row grow? 
Well, if you're in with the bankers, the bankers will keep you going because they need you or they want you to or your buddies with them or they sit on your board of directors. Is that fair? It's not fair. But it works. Life is not fair. What's this about? Power and control. And what, what's power and control? Well, who's your God? Give me new religious people that have a direct relationship, maybe not even that religious. God is money for most people. They won't admit it. They won't talk about it. Money's got a lot of weird connotations about it. You know, dirty money, hidden money. People don't like to talk about what their net worth is. And that's fine. I'm, I'm for privacy. I don't say you should. What I'm saying is there's a lot of emotion. But it boils down to power and control. So if you go up from the big banks, you go to the central banks. And then you go to the international central banks. And then you go to the central banks of central banks, which is the BIS. How many know what the Bank of International Settlements is? Yeah, we all do. It's a banker's bank. I wrote a fair amount of articles about it. I used to actually be able to be a shareholder in it. They stopped that. They brought all the shares back. It's a closed system. And I don't know if the statement is true anymore. So let me say that, because I like to deal with fact. You know that. But at one time, it was a fact that the only accounting that the BIS did was gold. They did not care what your foreign reserve assets were. They did not care what stock holdings you had. They didn't care whose bond you held. They didn't care what cor corporate you identified with. All they cared about on your balance sheet as a BIS member was how much gold you had. What does that say? Think they think gold's money? They care about money. Does it? It doesn't. I mean, there's times in history where it absolutely rules. There's times like now where we're in this kind of chaotic period where we're kind of floating around trying to figure out what's going on. But I think the main thesis I want to and I'll probably emphasize gold too much is the power into control. And then here's the final statement: the banks don't lose very often. Is that very repeating? Yes, it does, David. The banks don't lose very often. So if you think, in my next continuation of this, that we got a way out with the cryptocurrency and you know your constitutional silver bag and all this stuff. Believe me, the, if, I, you know, if I had my magic wand, we would have freedom, free markets, and no effing bankers. But life's not fair, and I don't get to rule the world, unfortunately. But <laughs> I'm joking. But that's the way it is. So all this talk about the reset and going back to gold standard and all this stuff, I don't know. You know, I write about my best thinking at the time, subject to change, try to keep you all informed, try to keep you balanced, try to keep you not too focused on money, but focused enough where you can have a balanced life and not, like, you know, worry about it. You pay me to worry about it, okay? So you guys don't worry. But I am steadfast in my argument that they are not going to relinquish control easily, if ever. Not that we can't win it back, but it's not, it's not necessarily going that way. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, so I'm going to paraphrase what you said. I'm going to try to make it more succinct, and I'm going to try to then present it. And if I'm off, you tell me, David, you missed it completely. So in aggregate, what I think you said is, look, they know as well as you and I know that it's out of control and it isn't going to last. It can't. They know there has to be a reset. I'm not sure that they know how they want to reset it. And there may be, and I'm going to give you benefit of the doubt on myself, there may be enough heart left in these 
folks that there might be an allowance, let's say, for a more free market approach to the banking system at large. There is a possibility that there are cryptos out there or another monetary system or two or three. I'm for competing currencies. I'm for other monetary systems. I'm for let the market determine what works for us. And I'm for us running it, not them. And I do hold that possibility could happen. But you're right. They're at a point where they know it's blowing up. My, what I'm trying to suggest and emphasize is that they don't want to give up the reins of the next system. But do you think they could really even, they're not even interested in being involved in the, in, in the new system? I think they are. Think Let me finish and we could. All the, well, they don't care because you pay for their mistakes. When they blow up a bank, it goes on the taxpayer to make up for it. I do. I, one of the few I read. I know. Well, we could go in there. We're going pretty deep. I got to keep going. I will address it at a cursory level. And if I have some time after, I can speak with you privately. But my main thesis for everybody for clarification is banks usually don't lose. They know it's coming down. They're probably prepared for the next system, whatever it is, or systems. And they're probably going to want to be in control of those as well. That's my take. So what uh, I'm putting up here is sort of contradicting it a little for this woman's benefit and everyone else. So the BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa have pretty much put up a somewhat of a barrier against the dollar hegemony. I mean, all this really means is that the dollar will quit being the reserve currency of the world. It'll probably be some type of world currency. and in the interim, because I don't think any of these guys really know, that's my take, and it's a studied one, doesn't mean I'm right, know exactly how they're going to move into the next system. They know this one is not going to go much longer. And how it's going to move, again, I'm not sure they even know. But I've got some ideas. But these five countries have kind of backed away from the dollar a great deal, made their own trade agreements, and basically have buffered themselves from a dollar collapse. But buffering yourself from a dollar collapse doesn't necessarily mean you're exempted from the dollar collapse. You follow my wording? It's like if you're in an automobile wreck and you are driving a Hummer that's got two inch steel and you're in the middle of a wreck, you're probably gonna come out in better shape than someone that's driving a Volkswagen. But you're still gonna be, you know, when that happens, you're still gonna get hurt to some level. Do they trade in their own currency? They do trade in the Yuan mostly, yes. Yuan, yeah, in the Chinese currency, yeah. Um, Latin America, uh, interesting. This is the GDP of the Latin American countries. You can see most of them are in the two, three, even some in the four range. So a lot of silver comes out of Latin America, and their GDPs are actually pretty high. Of course, Venezuela is a basket case, as we know. Uh, Nicaragua is negative, and Argentina is negative. Um, just showing the Venezuelan inflation rate because I do not, do not, and I do not believe that the United States will ever go into a complete hyperinflation. We don't need to go to a hyperinflation to have a complete total currency crisis. It's not required. All we need is people to back out of the bond market, not accept a long duration instrument like a 30 year bond, 10 year note, even a T bill. So there's two ways to fail. Either fail slow or fail fast, I'm kind of joking. Either say we can't pay our debt, which we can't, and let the bond market readjust, shoot interest rates up and get what you can, which is very unlikely, or you default on the currency. I'll pay you for that 30-year bond. You got 100,000, here's your 100,000, but it pays your light bill for one month. That's usually what happens. That's probably the direction we're going. But again, I don't think we're going to hyperinflation. The reason being is that and I've thought about this probably as much as Jim Rickards or anybody on the planet, but when you get forced higher prices <clears throat> in interest rates, the cost of money, bond values go down. And that's deflationary as can be. I mean, if you've got a $100,000 bond and inflation rates double or yields double, that bond may be worth 50000 at the market, it's still got a 100,000 face and you'll get that face at maturity, but the maturity is say 15 years away 
and you know <laughs> that that money's not going to be worth much in purchasing power. I guess Alan Greenspan said it best. I'll repeat Dr. Green expand, as I referred to him the whole time I was writing about him when I was early days of the Morgan Report. The United States will never default because we could print money forever. But what we can't guarantee is the purchasing power of that money. That's how he said it, almost verbatim. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. It's all one of my lines. I used to, I did a, a TV show for Monex or a DVD. And I say, you know, it's, the money's worth less and worth less, and then it's worthless. And that's basically what happens. Yes. Yeah, because they know in the end game there's one anchor, and that anchor's gold. They know that. They don't broadcast it. They don't say it in the public. But that's why. Because whether or not gold enters into the next monetary system, I do not know. I know it won't be a real gold standard. It won't be a gold coin standard. It won't probably be an exchangeable standard where we actually get to touch it. But I think it will be used. It'll be used because it's such a psychological thing for human beings. There's just sort of this intrinsic innate thing about when you actually hold gold for the first time, there's something that you know about it that just says, this is something valuable about this. Now, I'm biased, and I've been in the market for many years, but I've done experiments. I mean, when my kids are little, you know, I have their toys out there, and I have a silver dollar, and I throw it out there and just watch to see what would happen, you know. They go to it. They just gravitate to it. You know, I don't know why. Well, so that's one data point. Look, I'm an engineer, and I'm going to take one data point and say, oh, yeah. So I do it again and again. And I did it downtown, San Jose, it was downtown Spokane. <laughs> and I did what I called the Krugerrand experiment. You can look it up on YouTube. And gold was hitting $1,000, and people said it was a peak. And the only girl I couldn't get that gold coin back from was this little three-year-old kid. <laughs> She's running away from me. She wanted to hold on to it. Anyway, I digress. I come back, the future of money. I don't, like I've said several times already, I'm not certain, and I have a kind of vague, foggy picture how it's going to go, but I don't know. But one thing I do know is it's a big push for a cashless society. And whoever sat in the back, and we all agreed, or I think we all agreed, or most of us agreed, that you know, it's all about power and control, and there's nothing more powerful or more controlling than not being able to use cash Everything you buy is known. Everything. And that's the big push. Yes, sir. Why should we listen to what President Biden said in his pretty big weekly Morning Press? Yes. I remember in the 90s, there were old good men gathered in that vote. Yeah. Absolutely. Maybe. I won't argue with you. you know, I could go a little deeper on that, but I don't have time. But you're right. What you said is correct. And you had a question. Yeah. They wouldn't take U.S. cash? Where? Puerto Vallarta? Okay. 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 Well, that's a good segue to what I want to say. In India, they're making everything uh, biometric, meaning India, you know, when you, I just said about the data point, you know, you know, one or two, you can't extrapolate that and say that's how it is. But you got 1.3 billion people, and they take away their cash, which is basically what happened in India. And now they're making everyone either give a thumbprint or an iris scan or both. And these are what people are called in the industry as unbanked. Unbanked means they don't have a bank account. And they don't care. The bankers really don't care if they have a bank account. What they care about is this site says power, this site says control. Power and control. <laughs> so anyway, that's what they care about. So if they've got everyone in a database, and of course it's all for their good, right? 
I mean, this woman back here is having a little bit of conversation with me. It's for their own good. These poor people need their government rice handout, and they need their health care checkup once a year. I'm not saying those are bad things. I'm not. I'm, I'm not trying to make light of that. But they're very eager to get identified because they need these things. They don't have access to them. And that's the way it's set up. So one thing I'll, you know, 99.99% certain of, it'll be a cashless society. So a little bit about the blockchain. I think most of you are familiar with it, at least at a cursory level. I'm not really deep studied in this. I've probably spent enough time on it to have perhaps a better understanding than the average person on it. Uh, a couple comments. They're my comments. They're not fact. I have a very, very, very difficult time believing that this uh, Satoshi Nakamoto made Bitcoin. The reason I say that with some authority is because of my engineering background. Anyone that could write code that perfect with one human being is absolutely almost impossible. Which means that it was probably a consortium of people and this name, Satoshi Nakamoto, that's fine. I don't care what name they give it. But the idea that one human could write code that explicitly with no bugs, I don't buy it. If you read the white paper, from the CIA, I think it was published in 88, I could be wrong on the date. They looked at a Bitcoin type of a model, they didn't call it that. Plus, Bitcoin was funded partially by Incutel, which is a front for the CIA for startups, venture capital. So I'm not a big Bitcoin aficionado and to be a non-hypocrite, I have some, and the only reason I have some is because, one, I want to kind of test it, but the main reason I have it is the Morgan Report's written in English, German, Chinese, Mandarin, and Spanish. And my Spanish counterpart that writes the Morgan Report or takes it and translates it is they're young and they're real big on cryptos, and they wanted to pay me in, in Bitcoin. Well, I earned the money, so I said, sure, it's a money or not, we won't debate. So I got a wallet and I've got some Bitcoin. For those who want to know how much, it's about 100 bucks. So I am involved with this silverback cryptocurrency. It's called Load. These people, not me, deemed it the future of money. As we all know, silver has really got the monetary history so far. They want to institute it as a um, mechanism to be not only in the crypto world, but also to be backed by silver. There are two sides to it. There's the load coin and the AGX coin, or the load token and the AGX coin. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through this for you. It's too complicated, and it's really not. I'll try to make it in layman's terms. But if you contribute silver to the program, it's 100 ounces minimum and I contributed a few hundred ounces, but not a lot, because at first, I love the idea, but you know, if anyone's gonna make a mistake, I can make it for you. You know, you can climb on board if it works. Yes, if it doesn't work, then let me lose the money. But if you wanna participate, I'm gonna tell you not to. If you contribute like I did and it works, then you will receive payment in silver. So your silver will be earning you. And how do you do that? Well, same way the banks make money, on interest, on a yield, on a spread. The same way a coin dealer makes money. Gold's at 1,200 an ounce, you call up, you buy the coin, it costs you $1,240, right? Because it costs to mint the coin, it costs to transport the coin, and also the dealer has to get a fee. Same thing here. So the token will sell for more than the spot price of silver, right? Because there's things, I mean, you gotta have computer power, you gotta have people, I mean, you know. They're paying my hotel fare here, so when, you know, David's taking money from load. Yeah, I asked him, I said, you know, don't pay me for the lecture, but I'll, yeah, count me for the hotel, I'll take the money. So, full disclosure, okay, if you think it's wrong, go ahead. Um, the one thing that we don't emphasize a lot, and I do want to point out, is that merchants like me are going to be in the system, and we're going to be able to use the load token any way we see fit, so I can set my own price. So I have $500 for the Morgan Report in fiat right now. 
But if you pay me an AGX coin, I might drop it to 400 because I'd rather have something silver backed than fiat. So for you, as a subscriber, that might be advantageous if you're in the system to save that 100 bucks, right? And I'm happy to do it, and you're happy to do it. So anybody that's like a travel agent, a dentist, a doctor, a chiropractor, a newsletter writer, uh, oil change facility, whatever, they uh, can choose to participate in this program and offer their services as they see fit, full retail or not. And the people that set up part of this uh, are very adept at barter exchanges. And, um, and I think it's kind of a cool idea. But it's just coming into fruition now. And there's so many hurdles, and you know, lawyers are taking up most of the funds because things are changing. You know, it is a security, it's not a security, it's okay in this jurisdiction, it's not okay in that jurisdiction, and on and on it goes. I'm not gonna lie to you, it's been cumbersome. Load token benefits, idle silver, I explained that you can put it to use. If you're gonna do it, I tread lightly. You know, if you have a hoard of, you know, two, three thousand, four thousand ounces of silver, you might contribute one or two hundred ounces. It's not gonna make you or break you. If it works, you earn earning money on it. If not, you know, and it's wrong, then you know, you're not gonna, you know, jump out the basement window, you know. But you don't have to. So here's the token side. Again, this will have a markup. It's a pretty hefty markup. I didn't set it, they did. Remember, I'm their ambassador. I'm sort of like a salesperson, you might say. I don't like you know, that term, but I'll say it. If you're a silver stacker enthusiast, you can hold it and protect your purchase power, protect your wealth against inflation. Um, it's true because it is tied to silver, but it'll have a pretty hefty premium. It'd be like buying uh, more than a maple leaf. I mean, you're buying, you know, what you're buying uh, $15 silver, do the math for them, I'm getting tired. So if you're $15 silver and you're buying from the mint, you're gonna pay about 250. That's what a authorized dealer will pay. So 250 out of 15. So 20% so would be uh, three bucks. So it's in that range. I mean, it's not like super out of the world 70% premium, but it's, it's a pretty hefty premium. But it's not an unrealistic one. Am I making sense, everybody? Okay. Um, and I've got some cards, I'll leave them up here if you're interested. No obligation, you know, it's something I want to be aware of. And like I said, I'm a pretty conservative guy. I mean, you know, like I said, let me make the mistakes. I was talking to one of my clients here at dinner, and I said, you know, sometimes I'll buy a stock, I won't even tell anybody to see how it does. So I take the loss so that, you know, what I call my people, and I mean that affectionately, don't have to, you know, whatever. So it's kind of, I'm kind of like that with this. I'm sorry? Um, you can read the website. It's a mother load, hitting the mother load kind of thing. And it's also have us another connotation as like a big load, you know. But that. Oh, do you? Is it doing well? <laughs> oh, God, you should have talked to me. That's a. No, that's one I don't like. Those guys got a hold of me. I got, I got a real big story on that one. I won't say it here. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have uh, three minutes left, I think. Any qu more questions? Yes, sir. Well, I've always had, so I was a silver investor for the first year, year and a half I published. And then people thought all I did was silver, and that was really wrong, because I've looked at all the commodity, or all the resource sector. So I changed it to the Morgan Report, so that everyone would hopefully know that I cover, you know, I was the first on the rare earth elements, I was the first on cobalt, uh, you know, I've been first on a lot of the other, you know, minerals de jure, okay? So that was part of it. But silver's still my passion. But there's not much news on silver, right? And I cover all these other metals, but I always talk about the reports. If you're a paid subscriber, you know it's in there every month. And a lot of the stocks I still favor are silver stocks, like Pan American Silver, Wheat and Precious Metals, 
you know, one of my juniors doubled already. We just did an update. will be available for you guys probably another week. I just did the interview before I jumped on the airplane to come here. But what do I say? It's been a miserable, horrible, crummy market. I called the top, every top I've called. I called the 750 top, the $21 top, and the $50 top. I got all those right. I've missed the bottom along the way a couple of times. And I admit it. It's still probably the best asset you can own. I don't know. <laughs> and, and I might miss it. Why is it the best asset? Because it's the most undervalued and most prized. Remember when silver was at the 12 to 1 ratio for those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years? Think about this. Think about this. If you're going to hire a personal assistant, and all they could do is, is vacuum the house and do Excel, that's it. And you're going to pay them X per hour. But you guys interview somebody else, and they can do Excel, vacuum the house, wash the car, take care of the dog, and all this. Who would be more valuable to you? The second one. So you've got an element there called gold, and it does money. It does money really well, and the banks believe in it, and the banks are gold-centric and hate silver. They hate silver. But here comes silver, and it can make a cell phone, make a laptop, conduct electricity better than any element known to man, conduct heat better than any element known to man has acoustic properties unlike any other metal on the planet. But it's less valuable. In fact, it's so less valuable that it was only money. It's 9 to 1, 10 to 1. But now it's 88 to 1. Does that make any common sense to you? Yeah, it does oxidize, yes. But when it oxidizes, it still conducts the same. But yes, you're right. It will does not answer. So isn't that why gold was adopted more in money? No, gold was adopted more in money. And I'm pretty in this, but it's opinion, not fact. Because it's easier to control one substance than the other. And they mostly had gold. And they were losing. If you study the opium wars and what happened with China and Great Britain losing all their silver, and they hooked the Chinese on opium. If you study that thoroughly, what you're really going to find is they knew silver was just too frickin' valuable and they had to get it out of the monetary system. So they went to a gold-only standard. The whole thing about the Wizard of Oz is a metaphor for the Eastern establishment taking care of us working-class people, kicking them in the ass and getting rid of the silver standard. When Dorothy clicked her silver slippers, they were not ruby if you read the book, and got on the yellow brick road to the Emerald City, they were telling you in plain English that the tin man and the straw man, which is what you are, you're a straw man, you are subservient to the government. Remember I told you this woman over here, and I have a very dry sense of humor, I hope I'm not offending anybody, I don't want to, but you're basically owned by the government, and your straw man is your all caps name, and you're all socialists because you're all carrying a social security number. And unless you're a registered socialist, whether you're a democratic socialist or a Republican socialist or an independent socialist, I don't care. Because you're owned by the bank. And that's the way it is. There aren't many people who tell you that. There aren't many people who understand it. And they don't understand a nexus between a benefit and a God given right. Because you're as a freeborn American, you are giving God given constitutionally secured rights. But if you make a nexus and become a socialist, all you get is a benefit. And you're subservient to taking that benefit by whatever your master tells you. Does that give any sense to anyone? We're done with time. Sorry, I'm on a roll. I could do a whole nother lecture for an hour, but and I'm fired up to do it, but I'm out of time. Can I say one thing? You may say one thing. Okay.